Hi folks, if you're just joining on YouTube, uh, firing up your laptops, welcome. We'll be starting in a couple of minutes. Hello, Nick Smith here, speaking to you from London. Happy New Year and welcome to number 21 in our series of Alpine Clubcasts. I'm sorry to say that the forthcoming Alpine Club meet to the High Atlas, that the Caucasus, Scotland and Lake Co Como have all just been cancelled due to COVID, but they are all being rescheduled for next year. The big news this week was, of course, the first winter ascent of K2 by 10 Nepalese climbers, who joined forces for the final 30 feet to the summit at 5 p.m. on Saturday. Many congratulations to them, and we will devote an upcoming clubcast to K2. Any ideas for that, do get in touch with me. So today, it's bagpipes and blagging. Worldwide first ascents with Eustine Hawthorne and Tom Livingston. I really hope you enjoy it. If you're watching live on YouTube or Zoom, Please add any questions to the chat there as we go along and we'll try to get those answered at the end. And as usual, anyone in Zoom, you'll be unmuted at the end for any applause and do stick around for a chat. Tom Livingston is president of the newly revitalized Alpine Climbing Group, the ACG, a section within the Alpine Club, which is the natural home for up and coming young alpinists. And it's fantastic the way he's supporting and helping to mentor our young climbers. Tom has a passion for trad, winter and alpine climbing, and as you'll hear, for big, inspiring mountain routes around the world. Usain Hawthorne is a Scottish climber who grew up in the north, the remote northwest highlands, crofting, hunting and walking in the mountains. Since his late teens, he's reached a high standard in trad, winter and alpine climbing in mountain ranges around the world, and with first ascents in the Himalaya, Alaska, Canada and, of course, Scotland. Tom and Houston spent a 12 month period living and climbing together and tonight we're going to hear about what they got up to. Tom is joining us from Chamonix and Houston from Canmore in Canada where he's living the dream. Over to you Tom. Thank you very much and good evening everyone and uh, thank you very much for the introduction Nick. Uh, yes, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, some of the luck that we've had whilst climbing and I shall now hopefully seamlessly share with you a photo from uh, when things worked out, which is of course um, very nice and a rare occasion in alpine climbing. I know we're all climbers, but uh, I'd like to share some stories of some of the things I've learned rather than just uh, particular routes. And I'd also like to uh, enthuse about the amount of blagging that Ushin and I have managed to get away with on trips. But this is just an example of when things work out really well. And 
we get a lot of luck in alpine climbing. So this is a, a mountain called Latok One in Pakistan. And this is um, a mountain that I climbed with Alej and Luca, uh, two Slovenian friends of mine. So many stars had to align and so many things had to work out for us to be able to climb this mountain. So it was really fortuitous um, that we just got a decent amount of luck. We got the right weather window at the right time. Um, and we all had roughly the right idea about what to climb and how to climb. And sometimes it doesn't work out, but that's okay. That's just the way things uh, roll. This is uh, Fabian Bull about to uh, rage on um, a mountain in Canada, Mount Fay, where Fabian and I quested up some uh, steep mixed ground on the east face. Uh, we were sort of climbing on this uh, friable limestone rock, which doesn't really lend itself too well um, unless it's all glued in in winter. And uh, we climbed maybe six pitches um, up the uh, east face of Mount Fay. Quite tricky um, climbing. And uh, considering Ustjan is now in Canada, Canada for a while, uh, perhaps a project for him to finish off. Um, you can see here, looking down uh, from pitch one and pitch two, uh, really, really uh, compact limestone. Um, but that's just the way it goes. This is a picture of uh, Fabi. The next morning we bailed uh, after late on the first day, uh, after a full day of climbing. And as it turns out, it snowed quite a lot. Um, so we were actually pretty glad that uh, we were down safely, ready for a, a short, by Canadian standards, uh, 20 kilometer ski out. Maybe it's 10 kilometers, but it feels like 20 actually. And back to uh, blagging, um, we which is here uh, in India with Will Sim and with Ushjan. Um, this was in 2019. You can see um, a couple of these folks in the photograph are uh, um, sort of military police or police officers. And we were in the Zanskar Valley um, in the Indian Himalaya and uh, trying to go alpine climbing when we received quite a lot of fresh snow. Um, we were sort of drinking cups of tea with our base camps, like dudes who are um, really friendly and very relaxed. And we were sort of hoping that the, the nice weather would improve um, climbing conditions when um, looking pristine with their trousers pressed uh, through the snow marched these two police officers who said, we're coming to rescue you. We, we've been uh, sent to help you out here. And we were sort of quite bemused by the idea of uh, needing to be rescued. We were totally fine, as you can see, with our Quechua chairs. The Indians were very delighted that a decathlon store had opened in uh, New Delhi. Um, and so you can uh, imagine our surprise when they basically said, we are not leaving base camp without taking you down with us because we've been ordered to take all teams down from the mountains. And this was kind of an understandable, if slightly over the top reaction, but that set in motion um, a series of uh, perhaps um, two full days of traveling down from the mountains. Um, I was sort of elected because my name was on the, on the paperwork for this trip, but I was elected as the team leader in all this Indian bureaucracy um, to go down the mountain with these police officers. We then tried to use the only phone in the village, which occasionally worked, to call the uh, local deputy police chief because the actual police chief was probably busy on holiday. And then we tried to get a permit that way. In the end, we had to hitch a ride via someone's wedding, like the whole valley turned out for this Tibetan wedding, and then go to the, the nearest... Um, town where the police chief with his aviator goggles on aviator sunglasses on was saying ah oh, well i'm not sure if we can give you the permit and i was saying well we we're so close to the summit we we've got a joint indian and uh, british expedition we just need one more uh, summit push and oh you must come and visit me in london and uh, and then he sort of said, oh 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 right you're so close and it's a joint expedition and oh you're from london which i'm not but uh, he seemed to like the idea and thankfully gave us permission to continue our expedition. Unfortunately, we didn't climb anything after this 
a really big snowfall, but we tried. The other part of blagging um, is to do with uh, check-ins uh, for airport baggage, but that's another story. So the other thing I'd uh, like to just enthuse about is um, preparation. And this is Ben Sylvester heel hooking like a pro in Scotland. Um, I believe this is the Godfather uh, or the God Delusion. I think it's the God Delusion um, on Ben Vaughan. Um, and Ben, as in Ben Sylvester, not Ben as in Ben Vaughan, um, you can see has climbed like 10 meters left, 10 meters up, and is now climbing 10 meters to the right. So it's like classic Scottish stuff, but we'd taken loads and loads of gear. We'd done loads and loads of research. You can see I've even used my ice stacks as a part of the belay. Um, we managed to get the right forecast or refresh the right forecast so that we had what we wanted. And uh, it was really, really cool when things work out and, and we managed to climb something which felt like the light, a nice combination of luck from the Scottish weather and the Scottish conditions, but also a bit of preparation. The other part of the uh, sort of preparation thing, which ties in nicely with luck is this. This is looking down at Ali Swinton, uh, who's climbing one of the crux pitches on a new route that Ali and I climbed uh, in 2019 in Pakistan on Koyo Zom. Uh, so this is near 6,300 meters and looking down at this amazing, really steep, but quite positive and juggy and well-protected uh, 3D climbing. We just had a bit of sunshine right at the end of the day. So it felt really, really surreal to be climbing here high in Pakistan on a new route that we just didn't know if, if it would be possible when actually it was a bit like Gogarth in North Wales, this again, steep, positive, but relatively well protected, um, relative to, relatively well protected climbing. Stuff that I really, really enjoy um, and stuff that I uh, quite like to um, push a little bit, but then suddenly to be doing that at 6,300 meters just felt really, really lucky. And then finally on day five to get very, very close to the summit, as you can see Ali here, uh, the summit is just a uh, hundred meters behind me with the uh, plains of Afghanistan stretching out into the distance and then to the north, um, perhaps Tajikistan and China, if I've got my geography right. So really, really special, um, really, really special experience and a, and a great way of combining all those years of like, oh, well, imagine if you could take the difficulty of Gogarth and the um, steepness but well-protected climbing and then put that at high altitude, wouldn't that be cool? This is a little photo from this summer and this is just to say um, how bad I am at climbing still. Um, this is falling off on a deep water solo um, down south and how we've all obviously had to like completely change our lifestyles due to COVID. Um, so I suppose it's just a refresher for me and for us to keep uh, just having fun and to try and enjoy ourselves as much as we can. Um, I've been wanting to go here for years, but all it took was a global pandemic for me to actually look closer to home and to see uh, what you could find. Um, that's actually only an hour or two from down south where my folks live. Then I've just got a few more photos of when things work out um, and to link back to what Nick was saying right at the start, which is where Ushjan and I um, sort of had a, a bit of a baptism of a fire by going to the north face of Mount Alberta a few years ago, um, and then realizing that we uh, should probably do some more climbing together and, and uh, things working out that way, which is great because then the, the following 12 months, I think we probably spent six months pretty much on a trip or climbing together. Uh, we climbed really, really cool classic routes like Divine Providence um, and the American Direct in the Alps. Um, we climbed plenty of stuff in winter as well. And we also went back to the north face of Alberta, seen here in the background, and you can see Ocean here doing his blue steel uh, impression. This 
it sort of epitomizes uh, Canadian Rockies climbing, I think, for me at least, with this really mythical, really uh, wild and intimidating North Face. It kind of um, sums up the, the partnership as well, how things really work out when you get in a role, when you get a bit of momentum. It's a bit of a shame that uh, COVID has kind of stopped all our alpine climbing momentum for the time being, but what can we do? But Ushin and I went back to this mountain after climbing uh, or trying to climb it um, the year before. This could have been 2015 or 16. And we went back the year later with much better weather and conditions and having climbed together lots before and managed to quest our way um, up the north face by making the third ascent of the house Anderson. Um, you can see these really cool quartz like slashes of, of color on the left um, in the jet black limestone, which is like either very compact or kind of um, strangely loose, somehow loose and compact. We managed to um, quest our way up the, the North Face for two days, staying in a really cool little bivy cave, this tunnel that goes off into the mountains. And um, it was a great experience for us because we wanted to uh, climb this route. Um, again, going back to that preparation thing, we'd even had like printed out photos from the Steve House and uh, Vince Anderson first ascent and luckily being able to spot where they'd gone from their sort of like bum shot photos um, meant that we could work out which way to go um, finding this tunnel was a was a great bit of uh, beta that we'd had from the first ascensionists but also from Nick Bullock and Will Sim making the second ascent and roughly keeping things under control the whole time, which is very enjoyable. Um, Ustjan and I did fall off each, uh, pretty much the only time I've ever fallen off ice climbing was on the north face of Alberta. And we still kind of chuckle about that. But thankfully not in this photo where I had to like uh, aid out onto the, or reach out to the uh, lip of this huge undercut um, ice roof. I don't know how, or why ice forms like this but uh put my axe into the lip and then very very gently clip into it and then do the same with the, the next ice axe um i was pretty glad uh that everything seemed to work out and not sure if i would do that again or recommend that to a friend but it did somehow work um so then to get to the top on the second day uh, was a real relief um you can see Ushin and i basically could be in Scotland with this kind of weather. And I've totally ruined this photo by putting my finger through Ustjan's head. Um, or maybe it's a mitten and a, and a glove like that. But yeah, um, when things work out, it does really work well. And uh, when you get a good roll of momentum, um, a good bit of luck, then it does feel great. And so, um, yeah, if we can uh, sort of look towards the future, then I guess it's it's more local trips um, and it's hanging off door frame edges to get strong for when we can get some freedom again. Um, and hopefully that will then give us a bit more uh, freedom and a bit more time to climb. So I'm now gonna hand over to Ushjan Hawthorne and uh, he shall nicely, neatly talk about Canada. So here we go. Hi guys, um, thanks for joining and um, thanks for Tom for introducing some of our adventures together. Um, so today I think I'm just going to mostly talk about a trip that me and Tom did to Alaska to climb this mountain uh, called Mount Jezebel, which is about 100 miles west of Anchorage in the Revelations range. Um, so it's really remote and probably one of the later trips I did with Tom. So it felt quite, um, lots of different things happened, but in terms of like the organizing and all these different things, it felt really, really relaxed because we, by this time we'd been on so many trips, it was just sort of like, we just packed the same, pretty much the same things that we packed the last time and, um, and then flew in in this tiny little plane to Mount Jezebel. And this is us flying in the plane. 
uh, and we tried to climb this face, which is the north face, um, and the only safe route we could really think that we could climb was up this big system um, here on the on the snow and into this huge big sort of deep chimney slot thing and we really didn't know what was in there but um, as it turns out there was a huge chalk stone um, with a sort of snow mushroom thing growing off the bottom of it which meant that um, and the snow mushroom thing was like the size of a bus so we really didn't want to go near it or touch it in any way or actually be underneath it which is where we currently were and um, so we actually ended up bailing off of there and the other thing about this that made it quite um challenging was all this snow and ice in here was actually really steep and um, but it wasn't quite um ice it was it was mostly like steep snow that you would find in like a 75 degree gully or something similar but for the, just the way it formed it's actually like 80 degrees 85 degrees but it's still that sort of like snow ice which just isn't quite supportive and also the rock on either side of the system was really um compact and it really didn't take protection very well so often we'd end up climbing like 70 meters or 80 meters between like terrible belays and very few runners um this was the one good runner i remember in about three pitches um of just climbing this sort of steep ice and it and it, i think that actually would have it kind of affected us in terms of turning around as well because we were both pretty mentally drained from from trying to climb this so Anyway, it just, and it started spin drifting as well, um, whilst we were uh, deciding whether we should turn around or not. And that was one of those ones that was kind of like an easy choice to turn around. It was, this wasn't going to work out. And so we bailed and went back to our base camp on the east face of the mountain and um, hung out for a few days. And then the weather was still good. So we thought, okay, well, we could try, try the east face. And so we tried this line here, which climbs up this sort of ice runnels. And then from this top of this steep bit, so this is about nine pitches of steep ice climbing. And then from this bit, it eases off quite considerably and follows this sort of big, huge system to hit the summit ridge up here somewhere. And uh, this was actually much better than the other route. And we managed to climb up here without incident and then all the way to the summit ridge um, in one day. Uh, here's Tom on one of the lower pitches, just to give you an idea of the style of climbing. Really sort of classic Alaska or Alp sort of sort of goulot of ice in, in between big solid granite walls. So like really, really brilliant climbing. Uh, and then this is a picture just as the sun's setting and we're almost at, um, as Nick Fowler would say, a five-star bivy because we could both lie down on it. And it was actually really sheltered too. So it made, made for a... Um, a good bivy and it was the first time that we'd been uh, we got to use this double sleeping bag that we'd that mountain equipment had made for us and um, so it was like minus probably like minus 20 overnight and we like shared this sort of pizza sliced sleeping bag um, and it was just through all the trips we'd done before we did like eventually refine this system of sleeping so that we could actually both be warm in a sleeping system that was like weighed less than a kilo so that was that was really good and it felt it felt really good to finally finally have it dialed after like a few test ones of us like stitching um on a single sleeping bag we would just like stitch a pizza slice bit of fabric so sort of both of us could fit in it but now we had it dialed so it was this like proper bivy system and it was actually pretty warm considering the temperature um which was really good um and yeah, we had a pretty comfortable night. And then the next day we had to traverse. We were sort of over this, on this side of this big gendarme sort of spike in the ridge. So we actually traversed around the, the side of it and then went up to the summit, which is just like 100 meters behind where I took this photo from. And um, so uh, the climbing was good and there wasn't really not too much to report about the whole experience apart from the way down when we decided instead of abseiling the way we had come down this face, on the on the left here we decided to abseil just do a few two or three abseils to reach a glacier on the other side of the mountain and that meant that we could walk down which is always better than abseiling so we were walking down this glacier thinking this is great and um, because we were getting to descend so quickly 
But then when we came around the corner to the call that we had to get back up and over to get to our base camp. So our base camp is on the other side of this call and we were on this side and we realized that we had misjudged the size and difficulties of this call um, and how to get up it. And the other thing that happened was when we were down here, it was sunny and we thought, okay, well, we'll stop and melt some, melt some water. And even though we'd spent a lot of time climbing and bivvying in the mountains over the last two years, we, for some reason, and I had no idea why, we only decided to take one of the tiny little things of gas. Um, and so we melted about 300 mils of water and then the gas ran out. <laughs> and so that we were thinking about waiting for the sun to, to stop heating up this, um, for it to be stopped being so hot. But as we'd run out of water uh, and we're slowly running out of food, we decided we'd just have to get up it somehow. And it actually ended up that the hardest climbing we did in the whole trip was up, up one of these pitches on this call to get up here. And Tom did a really good job aiding to aid up the steep wall. Um, and then we got into this notch just as it got dark and then had to abseil down the other side. And we didn't really know it was on the other side. We I presumed there was some sort of system on the other side. And, as it turned out, yeah, you can see here, we were in this sort of big gully system. And um, it was quite, quite comical because we were thinking it was great because it was good rock anchors on the si side of it until I got to this ab about four, four wraps down and I had to go under this big chalk stone thing with this huge snow mushroom on it. And then I sort of abseiled over the edge and I was sort of like ended up hanging in the middle of a chimney. So the chimney is like, as wide as my shoulders just like I can't actually turn around in it with my rucksack on but it's like 20 meters deep and I'm just like plumb in the middle of it so I can't reach the back wall of the chimney and I can't really get out the chimney so I just keep abseiling down and I'm looking at the the side walls to see if um, there's any more rock anchors so we can abseil off them and I can't really see anything and then eventually I get to the end of the ropes and I'm sort of just hanging in this big slot in the dark and I'm kind of like, oh, okay. And then I sort of turn around, like I can see, like look over my shoulder and I see that um, there, there's a chalk stone like jammed in the chimney. So I just put the tap around the, ch the chalk stone, tie a knot and then clip myself into it and just free hang in the chimney off of it and shout off repel. And, uh, and then Tom comes down. So Tom abseils down, obviously expecting me to have this nice anchor built somewhere. This, see, and he finds me just in this chimney hanging fully, like just sitting in my harness um, off, off this chalk stone that's jammed there. And I don't remember exactly his words, but I don't remember him being thoroughly impressed with, my <laughs> with the anchor and where we'd ended up. But in the end, it worked okay. The chalk stone stayed there. And after some awkward abseiling, we eventually got back to base camp. Um, and I thought this trip was really funny because... Um, it overall it, it just had a bit of everything it had us like trying something and then bailing and then actually get like trying something else and getting up it like fairly easily um, and not having any problems and then and then all of a sudden it was like we like so, this made like some slight estimation of what would be around the corner and it turned out we were totally wrong <laughs> and then um, ended up feeling a little bit um more out there than we thought by the time we got back to base camp. Um, and then I'm going to talk about Mount Robson a little bit because I climbed that um, recently and this is the this is the Emperor face. And it I'd heard about it a lot on the trips that me and Tom had been to uh, Canada on to climb Mount Alberta. I'd heard quite a lot about it because once we climbed Mount, Al Mount Alberta, people were like, oh yeah, you should go to, um, you guys should try the Emperor face. It would be really good. But um, with weather and time constraints, we never, we never got to see it uh, or try it or anything. But that's okay, because now I live in Canada and in September, um, my friend Ethan phoned me up and said, oh, do you want to go climbing next week? And I said, oh yeah, okay, sure. And, um, and then before you know it, you're actually, um, a few days later, we're stood below this huge face. And um, I'm, we're going to talk about just the decision that we had to make sort of at the base and, and to start up the climbing because, um, and it was much like um, the decision me and Tom had to make before trying to climb Alberta again in that um, 
once you are committed and start climbing these big faces in the Rockies, um, it's a lot easier to keep climbing than it is to bail off them. Often the anchors can be poor. And in this example, like the climbing on the face wasn't particularly really, really hard for a really long time, but it's, it's the commitment of, of starting up it um, made it a bit more uh, challenging. So we, when we got to the base, um, we couldn't actually see the face at all. All there was was just mist. Um, above us and it was so it was sort of still spitting with rain a little bit and and obviously we're sort of sat there so we were camped beside the river and we just sort of sit in our tent and look up at the face all all afternoon but we can't really see it we can just get little little patches of it sort of tempting us in to come and try but we never get like a good look at all the upper ice to see to see what's there um so the line we wanted to try um was this line it's a new route um, which climbs up any sort of way through here that you can climb depending on conditions and then up this the right hand side of this big system here um, and so after sort of debating it for hours which I've done with Tom quite a lot we, we sort of are like oh should we try should we not and there's all these different factors in your head sort of spinning around I think it's like a really interesting part of alpine climbing that that you know you, you maybe you should try or, or maybe you shouldn't and it and it's a very fine line between you being right about it's good conditions and safe to try and actually you shouldn't have tried and 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 the decision eventually was uh, after all our debates at night we were just like well we'll just set the alarm and see how we feel so um the alarm goes off at 1 a.m and sort of lie there awake and waiting for ethan to say something or Ethan's waiting for me to say something and we're kind of lying there and eventually Ethan says well will we will we go and have a little look and I say okay we'll have a look and and then um, we can always just sort of scramble up the star and then and then decide to to come down afterwards and um so we scramble up the star and it starts getting light and the big thing about climbing in the Rockies is that you're not climbing the <laughs> quite the features that you maybe climb in Alaska or the Alps or the Himalayas where they're like a nice icy gulot that really tempts you to start climbing. Often at the base of these walls, because um, they're so big, um, it tends to not be freezing when it's good conditions to climb the upper part of the face. And the lower face um, doesn't look very appealing as you can see, <laughs> and is mostly choss. Um, so the line we wanted to climb sort of over here in the left and we're so, so we're stood here trying to decide again and we're like oh well will we have a little look or should we just you know it's like you can hear water running behind all the ice fields and you think okay well we might as well go and have a little look um, and this is us sort of going traversing across all those bits of choss you can see um, and uh, so it's interesting just it's just so chossy that we always um, joked, and me and Tom made this joke when we were on Alberta sometimes, is that if you don't like the handhold that you're holding, you can simply just pick up the rock and throw away and make a new handhold that's slightly bigger. And if it's not quite the right size for your hand, you can just do it again. Um, so yeah, so we sold through some of this um, uh, slightly loose rock and then eventually got into the ice and um, in this sort of steeper feature. Um, Ethan leading here. So this was the first pitch that we put the rope on for. Um, and then that meant that we got into the big gully system and just kept climbing up this big gully system. And actually, like once we were climbing in this system, the climbing was actually reasonably straightforward, uh, apart from two pitches. All the rest was fairly good ice, like on the here, Ethan's traversing across to um to the base of one of the crux pitches, but all the rest of the climbing was like this, like neve, like really good ice neve on, on not too steep ground. And then apart from one pitch that I led before this, I had to um, uh, aid off a few cams in a, in a sort of wide icy crack. I couldn't really jam my hands in it very well. So I sort of hit the ice with my axes a bit and then stuffed a cam in it. And then I would sort of jump on the cam and the cam would cam enough that it would sort of break the ice by me jumping on it and it would stop it sliding so then I would aid on them a couple of times and then 
and then eventually got up this short band. And, and like a lot of routes in the Rockies, it's, it's just these sort of bands of steeper rock you have to get over. And then you're sort of into some easy ground again, and then another band. And then, so, so this is Ethan um, about to start climbing uh, the last crux pitch, which is kind of rears up steep above him. And he did a really good job. Um, he actually fell off uh, at one point, but um, thankfully his leash and his axe caught him. So that was good. Um, and then um, we climbed up to this, the ridge that the Emperor Ridge uh, that night and got there quite late at night. And then the next day we had to traverse um, the rest of the Emperor Ridge to the summit, which is quite a long way. Uh, and then climb up through the sort of crux of the second day is climbing through these big rhyme features. So you can sort of see like at the bottom of one here, but the ones above our heads, this is actually on the descent, but it's the only good photo I have of one. The ones above our head are like this. So we're climbing up this um, gully feature that you can see here, but like above it are just these like huge overhanging rhyme mushroom things that you're climbing between. And it's absolutely crazy. Um, and then eventually that meant that we were on the summit. Um, but I thought it was just a sort of rather than talking too much about the climbing of Robson, it was just like a, a good example of sort of how to sort of approach some of these mountains. Like you obviously have to be like very cautious with them because um, they are like kind of big um, bases, particularly Mount Robson. But um, it was just that sort of how sometimes you just need to try, be willing and be willing to, to back off, but just try a little bit and then, oh, it's still OK. And then. And then try again and just and you're like oh it's probably still okay and then the the same thing again so so that was um and i think it was pretty much the same way that me and tom have actually got up a lot of the alpine climbs we've done together and sometimes it just goes completely wrong and you're like oh it might be okay and you're, you're totally wrong and we both have to and we end up bailing doing some horrendous abseiling and um, which is what happened on the first the first time we traveled but um so yeah but i thought it was just um a good example of, of like mount robson it, it just just doing that sort of trying a little bit and seeing how it goes and then it and then all ending up to sort of working out pretty perfectly so that was good and then um yeah obviously just the next we slept on the summit and uh, the next day we had to descend all the way back down which is a really long way it's like maybe three thousand meters down to down to um back down to the road so a uh, really sort of big experience. And, and I thought it was really cool. I feel like um, the Canadian Rockies can be um, underestimated sometimes slightly in, um, in terms, in comparison to Alaska or the Himalayas or Patagonia. But actually, I really feel like some of the, some of the mountains here have as much, if not more adventure um, for people to come and experience. Um, like more than you would find in a lot of places in the Himalayas in it. And it's a, a really special place. So I definitely encourage any members to come and experience it if they can. Um, and I'm gonna now hand back to, to Nick. So thank you very much for listening. I think Nick's gonna get some questions. Good stuff. Thanks, Yushin, really enjoyed that. Uh, amazing to see the way that the climbs that you talked about just sort of unfolded, um, yeah. It was really fascinating. Thank you. So folks, um, if you've got a question for one of the speakers now, do switch on your video, uh, go with your mouse to the bottom of your screen, click on participants. And at the bottom of that screen, you should see the option to raise a hand. And if you're on YouTube or Zoom, uh, you can also type a, a question into the chat. Um, Nigel hopefully will, will, will see that and, and uh, put his hand up. Um, so let's have a look, let's see what's coming in. Uh, well, there's already one coming from YouTube actually. So um, should we start off with that one? Is that you, Michael or Nigel? Okay, I'm here. It's a question for both of you, Houston and, and Tom. And I think it's referring to Mount Jezebel. Um, just a question about the conditions. Um, how did you manage to repel, considering the snow and ice conditions that you faced? Um, so, on the on the north face, we managed to to repel because 
we could f kind of find rock out anchors sort of out of the out of the gully system so we could kind of like swing around and find um some cracks in in the rock we couldn't uh, abseil off the ice or snow but yeah we managed to sort of swing around a lot more the places that we couldn't have climbed to 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 find anchors to wrap off of i think we had um i think we had two wires left by the time we got off that sounds fun Great, thanks for that. Um, there's a question from Joe and Tim. Your your name is Joe and Tim. Um, should we un? I'm trying to unmute you. Go ahead. Hello. <laughs> We're just wondering what you boys have got planned next. Uh, I think you need to unmute Tom. By the way. For me, I'm in Canada right now, and uh, I think I've got a trip to Peru planned in August, um, which should be good. Uh, but yeah, I've not I've not made too many plans, uh, fixed plans anyway. Hopefully, I'll try and go alpine climbing in the Rockies in April or March, depending on conditions. Cool. Cheers, nice. Tom's not I on. should just uh, say that hopefully you can all hear me, and um, yeah, that uh, hopefully you can we'll we'll go climbing as much as we can wherever we can. Um, right now, I'm in the Alps, um, but this is also a bit of a shameless plug because Joe and Tim are part of the Young Alpinist Group, and so <laughs> hopefully I will go to. Uh, well, Alaska or Nepal or something like that um, this spring with the Young Alpinist Group, um, which the Alpine Club is supporting very generously so far. Um, so thanks for that. And yeah, I think just to follow on from what Ushin was saying, it's great when you get a bit of momentum on trips. Um, I went to Alaska, the Alps, Scotland, um, then Pakistan and then India and then back to the Alps, I think, in 2018. And that's really one of the best years of like getting loads of momentum going. Um, bit of a shame that uh, we are uh, on pause at the moment. But anyway, another question um, back to you, Nigel and Nicholas. <laughs> uh, there's a question from Andy Stratford. I, I... He, he's written it down, so I'll just go ahead and it's one for you, Jin. Uh, he says, do you miss Scottish winter climbing? And uh, he's particularly thinking of first ascents like the giant. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I do. I do really miss Scottish winter climbing. It's, um, it's really good. Um, I particularly miss the solid rock, which uh, there seems to be a distinct lack of in the Canadian Rockies, uh, especially like I've done a few new routes here recently uh, like um, did one last month or something and tried another one last week um, so there's still the possibilities of going doing first ascents here but I really miss uh, the climbing in Scotland it's um, that sort of mixed climbing and the, some of the special ice routes like the giant and stuff um, yeah they're, they're really unique, unique and um, having done lots of the sort of higher standard and sort of considered four star routes over here. Um, I would say that the, the really good routes in Scotland are, are equally as good. Are you saying that the Scottish four star system, how basically the UK has got three stars for a really good route and then there Scotland are, goes, are, this is four there, stars because it's only in four star routes in Scotland. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> 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 that's a lot of shit <laughs> but yeah also it's pretty funny isn't it do you remember when there was some good weather when Ushin and I were in uh, Canada a while ago and we like went through plan A, B, C, D and then basically went to this like uh, near the town thing called Harling which is just a just, like, mini mountain with a steep wall on it and we climbed one pitch up it and you were just like this rock is just so bad <laughs> so bad I like placed a peg and you just hammered the rock around the peg and the first peg fell out Whoa. but still I mean four stars in Scotland 
is is just ridiculous, by the way. <laughs> so on Scotland, while we're on Scotland, uh, obviously you, you carry bagpipes on your rack, do you, Hishin? <laughs> <laughs> no, I sometimes do take, um, I have a, an electric bagpipe. It, so it's like just the finger piece. It's like an electric one. So I sometimes take that on expeditions with me for something to do in the bad weather. So, yeah. The electric finger piece. Brilliant. You'll, you'll have to play us out at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's another question coming uh, on YouTube, Nigel. Yeah, I've got a couple here. Um, so uh, first one, I'm just wondering if you have any tips for progressing from Scottish winter to alpine climbing. That's from Patch99. Um, you can go first, Tom. Okay, uh, I don't know. Um, I think we should we should write down all the stuff we've learned, which is like, be faster, be safer, uh, put more gear in, take less clothes, take less food, but just the right amount of food and just the right take, amount of clothes. Take more gas. Take more gas. Be psyched. Go climbing all the time. Don't get a job. Uh, yeah we should write down all the wisdom one day but yeah. i'd say basically all of those things like climb as much as you can um beg borrow loads of kit and try and climb in summer and winter and on everything and like have a high technical standard of climbing as well if you can and i don't know yeah what did scotland prepare you well for Christian, yeah. for the Alps? um yeah i think uh um, Scotland prepares you really well for the hard pitches and alpine routes because the, the technical standard is actually quite high in Scotland. You can do lots of it. Um, but then um, I remember like when I first went to the Alps, I didn't know how to tie like alpine coils. And I just remember the person I was with, uh, Guy Stephen, I just remember like the first time, I just remember copying him to, to how to do it because I, I didn't want to admit that I couldn't do it. But then of course he could tell that I didn't really know how to do it straight away. So I would say just um, accept, like, accept that you're going to be, that you, you should like, it takes a long time to learn certain things that you can't learn in Scotland. Um, and but the best way of doing that is to just go up, to go alpine climbing as much as you can. Just like, um, obviously once we can travel again, it, it's, you know, go to the Alps and just try things. Um, Cause that's, that's the best way you, you'll learn. And, and, and definitely try things with more experienced friends and then also climbing things with um, people the same experiences of you because it sort of forces you to to take take the buck as it was. Yeah, the, um, on the question of partners and, and uh, who you climb with, um, I mean, you guys obviously have kind of honed your, your partnership doing loads together. Um, could you perhaps talk a bit more about that? And, and I mean, what makes a good team? Do you always agree about when to bail, for example? Um, what makes a good team? I think uh, climbing, climbing a lot together really helps. Yeah, for sure. I think like uh, by the time we had tried Alberta, when we tried Alberta the second time, for example, we'd climb much more together and it, it was easier for us to like make decisions and communicate and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I don't know, I think in, in many ways we're, we're slightly opposite. Like, like Tom, Tom is very optimistic and I can be slightly skeptical. So I think that kind of, kind of like combines almost a little bit, but quite well. So. Yeah, I guess having a, a nice balance. Um, and yeah, knowing what the other person, um, well, yeah, just basically um, balancing out a partnership um, for sure has a lot of value. Um, I should mention, just going back to the uh, Alps thing, um, that of course there are things like the Conville course, which are great for giving people a stepping stone um, to go from the UK to, to the Alps. Um, and going back to answering Alan Henderson's question about what type of training are we doing? Uh, I guess we're just trying to go climbing as much as we can, but we are, uh, yeah, I suppose doing workouts and, um, 
fingerboarding and stuff like that. I've not really been one to do too much picking heavy things up and putting them down. Um, but yeah, I guess it works for everyone. And just to answer uh, Rudder's question, big up Rudder's, Dave Rudkin saying, with people like Fabian Bull flying off Cerro Torre and folk climbing harder and faster at altitude, how would you each like to progress your alpine climbing in the future? I guess, um, well, you sort of answered the question of climbing harder and faster. I don't think paragliding has, paragliding is, uh, is the way. I don't think paragliding is the way, um, but you can certainly see some amazing things that some people are doing at the moment where they like basically fly onto a spantic and then walk up it or they, they're flying around the Pakistani Karakoram, which is absolutely amazing. They're sort of like crash landing onto the top of the mountain, tagging the summit and walking down. Um, but yeah, I, I was really excited to take the Gogarth feel and the sort of E5 Gogarth style and put that at altitude, which is what Ali and I very luckily did in 2019. Um, I guess there are obvious challenges like uh, Gashabram Thor, uh, Nanga Parbat, um, Makalu, Mashabram, big things like that. Um, and I think the French dudes um, who climbed the south face of Nupse a few years ago really set the standard or really um, put in a really good effort there of climbing super hard, super high. Um, it looked like a fantastic route. Stuff like that would be amazing to continue doing. Tom, is, the, is there a video of that or, or kind of where do people look up? It's coming out. They, did, they made a video of their 2017, I think it was, attempt. Um, and then the next year they went back and did it. And the French team, uh, like Elias Milleru, uh, Ben Guigene and Fred Degoulet, I think it is, um, they all uh, made um, a video, but it's it's like put on hold due to COVID, but it will come out, I'm sure, in the future. Um, Brilliant. And then, shall I answer Richard Naden's question of, apart from robbing banks, how do you finance your lifestyle? I remember being very poor in my 20s and making choices was tough. Climbing always won somehow. Well, I suppose you've again answered answered the question very nicely there, because if you want it enough, it will happen. If you uh, can um, consciously or subconsciously create a lifestyle which allows you to go climbing all the time, then then you will. I mean, I've picked up stuff like rope access work, where you can do a bunch of work and then disappear off again um, once you've earned some money and um, sometimes you get these nice virtuous circles where the more climbing you do, the more talks you uh, do, which is nice, and the more articles that you can do, and then sponsors help out, and the more trips you can do, and so on and so on. What do you reckon, Ushin? Uh, any tips? Because um, you're still in your 20s. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think it is just a bit like you said, like you just uh, make the you just make make the choices, uh, and obviously, I think uh, I would regard regard myself as uh, definitely sort of privileged enough to to always just you know be able to go home and uh, stay at my mom and dad's place and them not care. So so I think that definitely sort of definitely has obviously helped, and and yeah, but yeah, just like myself, I just do a lot of carpentry work in between things and you just pick some stuff up on the side, but yeah, it's definitely, definitely just about um, just booking the flights and, and, and having a go of it. And, and obviously I think that the, the expedition grants from like the Alpine club and the BMC and the MEF, they really make a huge difference, particularly when I was first getting into to going on bigger trips, like they were the difference between us, like booking the flights and going on a bigger trip and not. So yeah, it's yeah. They really, really much do. appreciated. Mm. And obviously kind of being able to take good photos whilst you're climbing uh, and, you know, so you can share it must be a big part of that, that whole kind of thing of, of being able to raise the money. Do you just use an iPhone or? or... Uh, no, I've got a proper camera that I carry with me. It's kind of funny because we're always like discussing weight 
and like how much this jacket weighs and where's the lightest teaspoon we can take and what about taking less food and then at the end of the day like at the top of my, I always like pick up my camera which weighs like about a kilo and put it in my bag so and it's always a bit of a bit of a toss up between taking it and not but most of the time I'm, I'm always glad I took it afterwards I really enjoy sort of being able to to sort of tell a story after and yeah. and I and in just going back to um like Rudder's question about um like sort of your alpine climbing in the future like I really enjoy going to sort of remote places um, and experience just like different totally different cultures and sort of all the things that you see on the way to the climbing on the way back from climbing so being able to take good photos of that I really appreciate and that probably explains why your your photos are much better than Tom's as well Hundred percent, and also go climbing with someone who takes great photos of you. That's a good. <laughs> Cheers for that, mate. <laughs> Sorry for not taking any good photos of you. <laughs> uh, there's a question from Derek. Uh, he says, "When climbing poor, steep rock abseil points may not be easy to find. How do you cope mentally with the fact that you may not find a good anchor?" Um... Yeah, terrifying. <laughs> I think you, you, you just learn that, but I think probably you have to find, you just, well, one is that you, you're sometimes a bit expected for it because the rock that you're climbing up is, is sort of like that. So, you know, you know, that it might be bad when, when, if you have to abseil. Um, but I think you just have to take the time. Like sometimes it takes like half an hour to find a good anchor to, to ab off um, like swinging around in the ab, but it just, it's like the most, important thing you can do so you just got to you just got to do it right there's no way yeah just it just like just put in the effort basically i think yeah it's still my most terrifying moment in the alps was when i i was abseiling and i heard a kind of crunch and then saw this this big block move that that i had a, a, a sort, of, sort of bit of gear behind and oh. absolutely terrifying i must say so yeah i mean any any tips just do it loads i guess practice yeah uh, yeah yeah practice lots and and um and and i would say depends where you're going to like try and figure out what's good so if you're on limestone take lots of pegs and things like that and and uh yeah sort of really like and that's what scotland can be really good for is is just getting good at, at weird gear placements there's more on YouTube. Nigel, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I've got quite a lot here. Um, one from HLJ. Um, hello, this was so inspiring, but I wonder how female climbers can get into the al alpine climbing. It seems like such a male-dominated field, and I'm just unsure where to start. I am based in Scotland, she says. Okay. Uh, well, one thing I would say, the trip I'm going to with in Peru is with uh, Chantel in August hopefully is with Chantel Astorga and Brett Harrington uh, who are both females and uh, they're really really good climbers really inspirational I mean they're, they're some of the best uh, alpine and rock climbers anywhere um, regardless of their sex so certainly I think just following them a bit more and I'm not sure if there's a female climbing group in Scotland but yeah, there should be, it'd be good to see something like that for sure. And I definitely appreciate that it's harder for girls to get into alpine climbing. Thomas? Yeah, someone's just said, I suggest the Women's Alpine Adventure Club for getting into alpinism. And that's um, absolutely right that it's kind of male dominated. And so that's one of the things that the young alpinist group that I've set up is trying to to change or it's trying to help everyone regardless of um everything to be able to get into alpine climbing or rather to progress once once you're good at alpine climbing um i imagine like the women's adventure women's trad festival um would be a great uh, thing to be part of uh, speaking to site women like hazel finley or emma twyford might be uh, good because they might know more it's a bit of a shame, but I don't know about women-specific groups. Um, but I, 
absolutely welcome and encourage a change like that. Um, and I don't, th and also like, I would be very happy to go climbing with someone regardless of like uh, race and religion and, and gender and stuff like that. Um, and it doesn't really matter who you are if you're both wanting to climb the same things. Uh, Richard Naden said the pinnacle club for climbing. Um, so there are, it seems like there are things uh, available. Um, there are things we've got to dig a little deeper. It'd be great if um, the Alpine club, you know, could do something to help that or the BMC might be, I'm sure are doing something like to try and help um, this situation. There's actually something that we're going to announce quite soon. Um, so watch this space on... on, 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 I, on I think Adele's put something in the chat, actually. So I'll come up. OK, yes. Yeah, so Adele's mentioning there a, 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 an outstrip this year for women. So 150 years ago, um, a number of women were kind of at the forefront of, of female alpine climbing. And I think four or five first, big, big first ascents in the Alps were made by women. 150 years ago this year, so we're, we're, we're going to be trying to to do something, assuming we can get out to the Alps um, to to mark that. So so watch out on the website for details of that. Uh, Lucy Walker, exactly. Richard Nadine's just mentioning she was the first to climb the Matterhorn, uh, and Meta Brevoort, who I think was the first to climb, um, uh, well, the beach the horn. first to climb with the Don, Don Blanche, the Weisshorn. The Matterhorn, they were all kind of done in that year and there was a kind of real flurry which resulted in a, a big surge in interest in, in female climbing. So hopefully as a club we can, you know, we can kind of use that as an excuse to promote more more women climbing. Yeah, and the, the only thing I'd say on top of that is um, the the female alpine and climbers you climb with, they're always really psyched if they hear about other females, like no matter their standard about trying to, trying to get into winter and alpine climbing. So, so I would just say, like, message them if you see, if you know they're there, because yeah. they'll, they'll, will help you out and, and be really, really like up for it. Cause they're always, they, I think they, they, it's something they, they all, all enjoy promoting and helping people with. So, so yeah, I would just say, just get in contact with people. They'll be really psyched that you do it. There's a, a girl called Jenny Dart who, she's the one who, uh, she works with the Women's Alpine Adventure Club. So Jenny Dart, she's a good person to get in touch with. And Adele, obviously, who put that message. Um, Nigel, do you, do you want to kick Yeah, off we have some more. Uh, should we just put a shout out for, if you want to look at our Meets programme as well, and I think all, all our email addresses are on there if you want to get in touch and attend as a guest. Um, another question from YouTube. We have um, from Neil. What's the best cooker for big routes and what problems do you experience at altitude with them? Shall I or do you? Here you can go. Uh, well, in my experience, um, and feel free to jump in, Ocean, but basically uh, cooking at altitude or cooking on big routes totally uh, uh, isn't very enjoyable and takes a long time. So I currently use an MSR reactor with a one or 1.7 litre pot or 1.5 litre pot, I think it is. Um, and you've basically got to do whatever you want or whatever you can to keep the gas uh, warm. Um, I find the reactor way more efficient uh, at altitude or at cold temperatures or in the wind compared to the jet boil uh, or anything else I've used. Um, I often um, take a little uh, empty freeze dried sachet uh, that's clean and I will boil a little bit of water straight away put the gas canister into this sachet and then put hot water in that way the, the gas canister is sat in a bathtub of hot water which seems to work better than just letting the gas get really cold um, Ushin have you got any more uh, tips? Maybe try and have like rather than having one big canister have two small ones and then you can like heat one up in your jacket and swap it. That makes a big difference. Basically, it basically revolves all around keeping the, the gas warm and trying to hang up the stove is just, if you can get it hung up, it, it's actually just provides, it's like a bit, it's just a lot less uh, 
energy intensive because the stove just sits there for itself for five, 10, 20 minutes, whatever, however long it takes. So it does make a big difference. And it's definitely something that's worth, um, yeah, worth streamlining because it's, it's a pretty long, slow process if you, if you don't figure it out properly. Any more, Nigel? Yeah, I've got quite a lot. Um, two, two people, um, Patch99 and Sean Hoskins, uh, saying, can you please say more about the Young Alpine group? Young Alpine is group. Okay, just very quickly, uh, this is a um, group and mentoring scheme that I've set up um, because lots of countries like, well, European countries have a mentoring scheme for alpine climbers around the sort of 20 to 30 year old that are already experienced. And Ushin and I were grumbling about not having um, lots of free money and lots of trips um, for uh, in a mentoring scheme similar to that for about three or four years. And then eventually I just sort of decided to set it up. Now the Alpine Climbing Group, ACG, is part of the Alpine Club and that's great. But um, what I've started doing is the Young Alpinist Group. If you Google it, then you'll find a website. But basically it's a three-year rolling mentoring and, and scheme and climbing group. It takes people who are already good um, at climbing and alpine climbing and hopefully supercharges them for climbing bigger and harder stuff. Um, you can find out all the information online on the Young Alpinist Group dot com or you can look it up on instagram or you can send me an email hope that helps next question okay i do have some more questions for you guys um who got to keep the futuristic pizza slice sleeping bag and Usdin, do you have any peaks in mind for peru and that's from josh cooper Uh, I think I think Tom's got it right now. I'm not quite sure how he managed to get it, but I think he's still got it right now. Yeah, I've got Bull Bag 3.0. Yeah, <laughs> the latest version. It's uh, yeah, but sorry, go on. Uh, well, that was all I was going to say. I think. Oh, and uh, the mountain in Peru is. Uh, oh, I've forgotten the name. Totally mind blank. It's uh, it's the one Josh Wharton got avalanched on, but we're not going up the bit where we can get avalanched. So we're going to try and climb one of the sort of steep rock buttresses to the side and then up one of the ridges. Uh, oh, it's really bad. I've forgotten the name. Sorry. Nigel, do you want to just crack on or are you, should we? Yeah, shall I yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris Lu Lewis, uh, Chris Lewis says, are you concerned about the impact of climate change on the future of mountaineering? It's yes. a super interesting talk. Thanks. Thanks. And yes, and we should all be doing more to reduce our... This is very interesting. Um, I don't know if I can answer it now, but can I just say, yes, this is one of these like terrible uh, things where we basically love going climbing but we're destroying the planet whilst doing so so i haven't got a solution yet other than um reducing my general carbon footprint and trying to minimize the travel that i do but then again i'd love to go around the world and go on three big three big expeditions a year so i'm uh, i haven't found a solution Ushin, what do you reckon uh i think climate change will have a big effect on on um, climbing, I think in the grand scheme of things, it, it won't matter in terms of the effect. And like, it's like there will be colder places that will become more accessible to go climbing in. And I think that if that's our major concern about climate change, we need to, to rethink it a bit because um, it doesn't really matter in, in, in terms of how much damage climate change is going to do to other things. So, um, yeah, I think I've um, one of the sort of reasons or good things about being here in Canada is that I fly a lot less because I have a lot of different types of climbing. I can still go alpine climbing. Um, so that's definitely been a bit of an eye-opener that if by living in Canada, I've 
quite happily not gone on any flights for a year, even though partly that's because it's been enforced by the pandemic, but I've still been able to do all the climbing stuff I like. So that's, yeah. And um, yeah, I, I obviously, yeah, we should all do more, but I think that realistically we should all be p- fishing for change um, across the whole, the whole of society rather than trying to take, you know, one less flight or buy a slightly more economical car um, because that's what's going to make a difference. I see Alex Metcalf has uh, asked, has the Alpine Club got any plans to offset carbon emissions generated from club meets? Um, that's a good question, Alex. You put me on the spot there. Um, I mean, so far all we've done is is just to kind of promote, we've, we've written articles on for example, going to the Alps on the train rather than flying um, and you know, considering the kind of different carbon footprint of different methods of, of getting to where we want to go. Um, as far as actually offsetting, um, I think, I mean, the club works in such a way at the moment that people sort of tend to go on meets under their own steam and make their own decisions. But I think as a club, we just try to hopefully keep our members kind of informed of what you know, good decisions, um, and uh, hope that you know, hope that they uh, that they listen. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, good stuff. Uh, Derek has said one small solution is to offset carbon footprints by donations to voluntary tree planting organisations, um, and uh, other other similar kinds of, kinds of messages. Um, Good stuff. So, Nigel, do we have any more, or shall I? No, that's that's it for you too. Okay. Um, um, forgive me if I've missed anything. Um, there are just lots of people writing messages saying thanks for the talk. I uh, love the love the photos. Uh, so good effort, uh, Houston. <laughs> um, uh, I'm good to see Tom was smiling just then. Uh, Peter Payne's asked, shouldn't you avoid butane in the canister mix for high altitude stoves? Don't know. Don't we always? I always try and find the canisters, like from uh, MSR or whoever, like a well-known brand with a good propane butane mix. But maybe that's what I'm doing wrong all, all the time. Well, it doesn't seem like you're doing, you're doing it wrong to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thanks very much, everyone. That's very kind uh, for tuning in. Um, yes, and, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll sum up, Tom. I think so. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt then, but uh, um, anything else, um, Yusin, do you want to say? Uh, I'm super jealous of you being over there living the dream. Um, must be great to be in Canmore. And Tom, being in Chamonix, uh, you guys are, are getting something right, I must say. So thanks so much. Um, uh, so it just remains for me to say, uh, well, obviously I'm off to rob some banks, uh, thanks to Richard's suggestion. Um, and our next Alpine Clubcast number two uh, is currently scheduled for six weeks' time uh, on the 2nd of March and will be an evening with Conrad Anker. So we're really chuffed to have Conrad uh, uh, on board. Uh, just back from Kathmandu, he will be. Uh, do have a look at the Alpine Club Library YouTube page where you can watch, like and share all the previous Alpine Clubcasts. Um, Thanks all for joining us. Uh, Keep safe, keep active, and please unmute yourselves now. Michael's going to allow that so that we can applaud tonight's speakers and do stick around for a chat afterwards. Good night from London. Yay!